we'll let Frank get started then. Okay. Has anybody seen this presentation before, just so I know? I think my gravestone's going to have founders of Lion on that sort of thing, a reputation. Uh, so we're going to talk about equity compensation, not just the founder's pie. And that's going to be important to you. How many of you have businesses? Well, you got a Could you speak louder, please? Could you speak louder, please? We're not able to hear Oh, okay. How many of you already have companies? And you've already made the founder pie decisions? 100%. Okay, that's <laughs> a good to split. <laughs> okay. Uh, how many of you are planning on starting a business in the next year? How many of you are here just because it seemed like an interesting topic? Okay. So. Here's who I am. I've been an adjunct or full-time here at CMU, dating back to 1987. Uh, I've run four different investment funds. Uh, I've been with consulting organizations, so I've sort of been there, done that. Over, I've been participated in the initial fundings of at least 400 companies. I've had investments in probably 1,500 companies. And so that'll give you a sense of what I bring to the table. So obviously, the initial question is, why do you care about equity compensation? And there are several reasons. If you're a founder, you need to determine how much of the founding pie you deserve as compared to the other people that are at the founding table. If you are recruiting somebody, stock options will be a necessary or an important part of the compensation package that you offer such a person. Usually with the, with the context of startups are risky, they're, even if they could play, pay market rates for salary, the risk element is such that to get good people to join you, stock options end up being the, the uh, pot of gold at the end of the rainbow that is intended to entice people to join you. <coughs> so you need a plan for how to do that. If you're being recruited, you need, you will insist upon stock options as part of your compensation. You will expect them. And the question is, how many? And how many is a function of the total diluted outstanding shares of the company? And so if you don't know both of those numbers, there's really no way for you to evaluate the value of what you've been offered. And I'll talk about that a little later. And usually, not only might an employee get stock options when they join the company, but it's highly likely that there will be stock options that will be used as incentive compensation on a year-to-year -year basis. And so making sure, being comfortable, with uh, the stock options, uh, the value, making sure they provide proper incentives as intended, all of that is, are part of that. So let's start with the founder's pie. Okay. At T equals zero, you found the company, and the founders are going to own 100% of the company at founding. The question is, how is that 100% divided? So let's say we have a four-person team. You might have a situation where there is one obvious leader, 
primary driver of the operation. And that person might get 50%, the other three may get an equal amount of the remainder. There might be some sort of semi-obvious pecking order of who's most important, dot, dot, dot. And maybe you can come up with an agreement on that. But more often than not, this is the way that many founder pies look. Take the number of founders, divide it into 100, and that tells you how much the company each founder gets. And this is sort of the default position because it appears to be fair. Okay? And fairness then becomes the driver of the rationale for why you do this. But the reality is it's not fair because not everybody is equal in terms of what they're providing to the company, what they brought to it to date, and what their expected contributions are after they get started. <coughs> if you get started with the wrong founder's pie, that has the potential to be irreversible and be a fatal flaw as you look forward for funding. And that can happen along many different dimensions. One might be that the, the founders somewhere down the line want to raise money, but there is, there's an argument among the founders that what was originally done wasn't proper. Founders have filed lawsuits against one another in the company. Investors don't want to get involved in any of that. So, if you have two founders, One jumps into the company, spends 80 hours a week working at it. The other one keeps his or her job. Should they both get 50%? Is that fair? Company is successful over the first three or four years. It's really doing well. One founder says, that's fantastic. That's the basis of what we're going to, the foundation for which we're going to grow the company and change the world. And the other founder says, hey, half a million dollars a year of getting out of the company, I'm happy. Why put it at risk? Let's just stay where we are. Does that, is that a scenario that works for a company? company needs additional resources. One founder provides it, the other founder doesn't. How does that play out? company needs additional resources. One founder can afford to support it, the other one can't. How does that play out? So you have all these things that can't be going on that that need independent consideration as you're thinking about the founder's pie and what its future consequences are. So if you've got two, think of the number, the amount of uh, noise that are going to be in the system if you have three, four, five founders. Yeah, the network effect is going to be, you know, 200 different pairwise conversations that, that you do with you. So, my suggestion is, you think about who should get what. Uh, who has contributed to date and what's proper compensation for what they've brought to the party to date? What are their anticipated roles into the future? What will they be contributing? All these slides, the slides and backup material will be available to you, so you don't have to copy the slides. And ultimately, when you're dividing up equity, 
its role is largely one of being an incentive. So does what you've done align agendas properly? Because you want ultimately everybody moving in the same direction. So there are any number of things that you could define as big, important, or of value. I've selected five. So you need an original concept of the business. If it's technology, it's perhaps the inventor. Uh, if it's somebody from an industry who knows distribution channels and can set up distribution of products that will drive the company forward, that could be something. So there is some core concept that drove the creation of the company and different people will have contributed to that idea. Taking an idea and developing a business around it is an important transitional step. So that needs to be done. Who's got an active Rolodex within the industry. Who knows the doors that they need to get through? Uh, how much, what's your track record? What all are you bringing to the table that are in, that's important to the company? Commitment and risk. Generally, this reduces itself to who has joined the company on what terms it hasn't. Because in the early days of a business, it's not unusual for some of the founders to be in there full time, not drawing any salary perhaps, and other founders being on the sidelines, being more than cheerleaders, but their ability to contribute to the company is going to be limited because they got another job. And then there's the responsibility. Who is chartered with doing the important things that need to get done? So, let's look at a case. We've got a university spit out, four founders. First founder is the inventor. Tenured faculty in many cases, international luminary in the field, uh, may, have may have patented technology that the university has, has, has pursued. And so he is the idea creator in essence. Uh, you got a second person who is joining on who's the business person. Somebody who can convert the business idea into a business model, into customer interactions. The person that can move the company forward uh, and be able to lead the efforts to attract investment money and things like that. The third is a postdoc, and the postdoc was a member of the research team, and he's actually the one who knows how to work with the technology. The inventor probably doesn't get his or, hand, hand, his or her hands dirty actually doing the stuff at the lab or whatever. So this person is important for being able to produce product. And then you've got a fourth person let's say a lab tech, and he just happens, he, she happens to be in the right place at the right time. So here are four founders. Now, as I've characterized them here, I hope it's fairly obvious that these shouldn't each get 25%. So that's, you know, step one. So, what I propose is putting together, you know, a weighted table of value. And really what this chart is going to end up showing is each of the cells in this spreadsheet is really a topic for discussion. It's sort of a dynamic uh, agenda. So let me show you the first step. All right, we're starting the company. So the first issue is how important are each of these elements to this company? And in this case, we're saying 
The idea is very important because if there weren't foundational technology, there's not really a business. Therefore, that's very important. At this stage of the business, it really is a startup. There isn't a business per se. So the business model is less critical at this particular point in time. It will be important as the company progresses. Domain expertise is always important. Knowing the people in the industry, luminary technologists who goes to industry meetings, uh, has keynote addresses and all of that. Uh, commitment and risk, who somebody's got to do things. And then the responsibilities are somebody's got to take ownership of certain actions. So uh, you can see hypothetically those are values of the relative importance of each of those five elements. Those five elements are not etched in stone. Five isn't a magic number. But in absence of things that would tell you that you need to do something different, this is a great way to get started. So now let's take a look at who's contributing what. Well, founder one is the person who invented the technology, and therefore that person is essential to the business. You can see the playoffs here. Uh, the postdoc is really important in terms of, or the, the founder one is important in terms of the luminary benefit. Founder two is the business person. So they are greatly responsible for the business model side of things, fundraising. Uh, this person tends to have jumped into the business, therefore uh, deserves uh, consideration in terms of the opportunity cost of joining this company and making no money, as opposed to working in industry and making 200000 a year. And then the responsibilities are what needs to get done, where do you need to position the technology, where does it have to be in order to be able to raise the money and those kind of things. So, you can see here, Founder 4 has a domain expertise might be helpful in the lab producing the product or developing you know, interfaces for software companies or whatever. So you can see through there, those are the relative values. And then we just do standard uh, weighting. And we pull those numbers together. So those are weighted values. We add them all up. There are 321 points involved with this. You can see that if you divide each of them, you, the 33%, 44%, 16, and 6. And uh, so those are not the answer. Those are insights to use as you sit down and try to resolve the issues that are under. It gives you a sense of comparative values based upon this, this process. It isn't, uh, it isn't predictive. It isn't, those numbers aren't the numbers. Those are ways of looking at, okay, the founder's very, the, the researcher's very important and they deserve something. Does this make sense? And then on a relative basis, do the orders of magnitude make sense? Yeah. Gee, you know, there's a recently minted MBA who doesn't have any experience. Does that person really worth 44% of the company? Things like that. So each of these cells really is a combination of all those factors. So is 70 a good number relative to everybody else? Those kind of things. So, in essence, you end up with a fairly dynamic agenda. And a lot of people will <coughs> A lot of people say, I really don't want to get into all that detail. 
Yeah, there might be some uh, disagreements, but let's put those off. Well, the thing is, at the time you're founding the company, in many cases, you're talking about rational individuals who can look at a situation, who can follow logic and quantification, and come to some kind of decisions that may require getting into uh, a little more uh, depth, for example, domain expertise. If the founder is not willing to be visibly associated with the company and being its uh, representative within the technical community because the, the technical founder doesn't want to jeopardize the position with the university, let's say, or is only doing this reluctantly because he's been convinced to do so, but he doesn't want, she doesn't want her reputation tainted by commercial pursuits, things like that. Is that person really, is the debate expertise really going to be contributed to the company or not? So those are discussions that can come up. Uh, you could end up in a situation where the founder wants this, look, if it weren't for my technology, there's no business. Therefore, by that simple fact, I deserve a majority of the stock because I am very much a binary participant here. If I don't participate, there ain't no company. That is not unheard of in terms of being in a position of a, a tenured faculty person in a, in a particular domain. But overall, that doesn't make sense in terms of everything that has to happen in the future. The technology is sort of like anti in a poker game. You gotta have it in order to get started. But the value of the pot is what happens after the ante goes in, after the cards are dealt. Each round of cards might lead to different uh, betting. And so the idea is important, it's critical, it's essential, but it may not be the be all and end all. So those are the kind of discussions you talk about. Another thing that comes up here is we've got founder four getting 6%, which isn't a large number, but isn't trivial either. Does this tech really deserve to be part of the founder team? So even the team itself requires advanced thinking in terms of is this person essential to the business moving forward? Or is there some kind of moral or ethical obligation to this individual because of their role as we've gotten to this point? One of the things that I tend to look at is, can you buy the talent on the street? Is this tech have unique skills that will enable the company to move forward or is this tech somebody I could go out and recruit for $40,000 a year? And if that's the answer, then maybe they don't deserve to be part of the founder's pie. Okay. Any questions yet? Yes? But isn't that the main expert found for, like, we're all replaceable now, so what's the key ingredient that you would consider? Uh, the, 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 the business idea is a, a, a uh, chemical uh, uh, formulation that requires the skills of a tech to do a critical step in titration or whatever is going on and it has special skills related to the company that you would have to spend time training and all of that. So those kind of things are, are what I look at. Uh, 
Okay, rules of thumb. Rules of thumb, by definition, aren't answers. Rules of thumb, you'll be able to come up with lots of counterexamples to what I'm about to go through. So take them with that grain of salt. But as you look at a venture and how it develops over time, a successful venture is technology based at least, it's going to have several rounds of investment. It, it comes with the territory. So you have to keep in mind, what's the end game here? Well, the thing is, when the day is done, when there is a liquidity transaction, the company gets acquired, it goes public or whatever, at that time, it's quite likely that founders and management will own somewhere between 20 and 33% of the company. Yeah. That's collectively, the whole yeah. founders buy. Okay. So that means the investors collectively own 67 to 80%. Okay, so you got to keep that in your mind because when you're talking about a founder's pie, you're also talking about where does that 33% end up when the day is done? And I'll talk about that a little bit later. During the early stages, because those stock options are really the incentive, the financial incentive for people to join the team, you're only, the, the company is always going to have an option pool in the range of 10 to 25 percent. So that there's sufficient number of options to go out and recruit people and give them meaningful amounts of options to join the company. You know, when there is a round of investment, each round of investment adds shares to the cap table because the investors are buying new shares that the company issues. Therefore, since there are more shares, the original stock option pool might go from 20% to 10%. It's arithmetic. You can't beat that. And 10% may not be an appropriate number for the company at that particular point in time. And if that's the case, then you would refresh the option pool with X number of options to break that number back up to say 20% or 15%, whatever seems to be appropriate at that time. So, what is a stock option? A stock option is not stock. So, what it is, it's the right to buy a share of stock in the future at a price that's determined today. And it will have some time uh, element to it at which time it will expire. That's going to be two years, five years, ten years, depending upon a lot of different circumstances. Five years is fairly typical. So it's, uh, it, it, what that means is, okay, uh, I, I, You've been granted 100,000 shares, but on uh, February 24th in 2025, if you haven't exercised them, they go away. So if the options look like they have value at that point in time, you would have to actually exercise them to, to hold on to them. So what's the big deal? Okay, you're granted 50,000 options. The exercise price is a dollar a share. Uh, the exercise price is a very important number. Normally it is related to the most recent round of investment. And in many cases, will be discounted from that number for an early stage company. I don't want to get too complex. But typically investors will invest in preferred stock. Stock options are for common stock. Preferred stock has a variety of features that make it them more valuable than common stock. 
And so there's a case that could be made that accountants and tax authorities are willing to live with that says if, if the most recent round of investment was at $5 a share because of the stage of the company, the common shares are worth a dollar a share. So it's a way of getting them cheap. So the company's acquired in five years at $10 a share. So the holder of the stock option, strictly speaking, would buy 50,000 shares at a dollar a share, would sell 50,000 shares at $10 a share, and would recognize a gain of $450,000. In situations like this, normally those transactions are virtually simultaneous. And in many cases, because what you're really getting is this delta of $450,000, instead of going through the buy-sell, you basically get stock appreciation rights where you will be granted or paid $450,000. Your options will never be exercised and it could be built at the the pool. So, but the fact of the matter is, at the time of a liquidity event, you may be eligible for, you know, $450,000. So that's part of the, you know, the pot of gold that you're driving. Uh, it may not strike you as important, but because those transactions would be happening within such a sh short time of one another, that, that 450000 would be considered ordinary income and not a capital gain. And the tax rates on ordinary income are different than capital gains. The tax rates on ordinary income tend to be higher than capital gains. So you need to realize that that's going to happen. In order for it to be treated as capital gain, you have to own it for at least a year. Yeah? Do stock options show in the cap table? Are they displayed? They're not shown on the cap table. They're probably a note in terms of there are stock option pools. There, there have been 500 shares allocated stock option pools, uh, pool one, two, three, and four, which represent each of the, and it'll say that of those pool, of those stock options that have been exercised, uh, 40% of them have been granted, so you have a sense of what's, and then vesting comes into play, so it may also say of the 40% uh, that have been granted, half of those have been vested, meaning they're owned by the stock, the option holder. So the question, how many is enough? Well, it all depends on how many f shares are outstanding. Fully diluted shares means the shares that are outstanding for the company plus the size of the stock option pools because they have rights against equity. Uh, also warrants, warrants are options that are given to outsiders like board members or whatever. They might get warrants instead of stock options. And so, if you've got 5,000 options, 10,000 shares, that's 50%. That's a big number. <coughs> 10 million shares outstanding, 5,000 options, you've got 0.05%. If you don't know what the fully diluted share base is, you don't know the value of the options that you're being granted. Vested. So, so far I've been talking about these options. It sounds like on day one, we're gonna get, we're, we're going to grant you 50,000 options. Oh boy, I've got 50,000 options. Not really. So, the fact that you've got options doesn't mean that you own them. They are going to be earned over time 
with a time-based vesting schedule. And the, the purpose of that is to tether the, comp the, the employee to the company. So, uh, and what that means is a typical stock option vesting program would be 25% of the shares vest on the first anniversary. And that's called a cliff vest, but it's a lump sum at a moment in time. And then the balance will be released from a Bible, will be vested 136 per month for the next three years. So the total vesting schedule is four years. And so that says if you leave the company at uh, two years, you're going to own. Uh, you're going to own 25% plus uh, 4% of 29. Maybe 37%, you know, I think. Yeah, 37. So, and that means the rest of your options just get retired. All right? And so that's there. Not only does it keep you in harness at the company, because of the time-based element of it, it, it says the longer I stay here, the more my options I get. But also, if you're granted options in the future, the clock on them starts over with the type of grant of those. And so you've sort of got this waterfall effect of options owned by employees that always have some future value associated with them partially to keep you aligned, partially to keep you on board. And uh, so that's what the vesting schedule does. So the cliff vest means a lump sum, in this case at the end of one year. The inverse of that is you're on probation for the first year. Now people, I won't say don't do it, but people don't get uh, terminated on the 364th day of that year. But theoretically, that could be the case. So if you're hiring this person, you're saying basically, if you have it worked out, we'll terminate you and you have no rights to any stock. So that's a protective measure for the uh, for the company under those circumstances. Obviously, you're hiring somebody because not only do you expect them to be there on the first anniversary, but you expect them to be there for the four years or more. And as I said, the monthly vesting tethers you to the company. But uh, way back when, uh, this type of program would have been 25% first anniversary, 25% second anniversary, et cetera. And having cliff vestings in the out years uh, proved to be uh, not fair and contentious. So the idea that it's vesting at 136 takes that off the table. And if the company is acquired, well, your stock is still vesting. More often than not, the employees will receive stock options in the acquiring company of a value that's equal to the value of your stock options. And so that when you're getting acquired, acquisitions are largely done to buy the people who are doing great things at this company with the thought that they can join the acquirer and continue to cr contribute there. And so from a company perspective, I like the vesting going out because it does keep the human assets associated with the company and therefore the, the, the acquisition can be done fairly cleanly. There are all sorts of uh, variations in that. Okay, uh, small piece of big pie. Uh, under normal circumstances, it would probably take about five minutes to go through this. But, so the question is, 
on day one, the founders own 100,000 shares. That represents 100% of the company. You don't know what the value is because nobody's priced it. You just set up the company. So now you go out and you raise a million dollars. And the million dollars is going to buy half of the company. So that means the founders with an option pool of 20%. So this is, a, a in terms of cap table interpretation, this is important. If you hear me say, I will invest a million dollars for half the company, your thought is, well, then my ownership is worth a billion dollars. But normally, there is this little tagline after provision for a 20% option pool. And so what that ends up doing is the investors get 50%, the option pool is 20%, but that leaves 30% for the founders. So you've gone from 100 to 30%, throw up your hands, say this isn't fair, I'm getting screwed, or whatever. Well, this is the way deals are done. And so now you work your way through that, Using arithmetic, you can figure out there will be a total of 333,000 shares outstanding after the investment. And that means that the investors are buying that number of shares, which when divided into a million bucks says they're paying $6 a share. Yeah. So who determines the provision of the option pool? That's the, the founders determine that we're going to do 20% of the option for an option pool? or. The investors will propose and maybe insist or it may be negotiated because uh, you, you've, you, you've got these opposing forces in place of, yes, we all realize that we're going to need options to bring on people. But if we, every share that we, if, if we start with a million bucks is going to buy half of the company then every percent that's in the option pool is going coming out of my hide as a founder. And so I might push back. And I said, yeah, 20% is ridiculous under this stage. We've got all these bases covered. And you might negotiate it back to 15% or 10. Or this might be the result of negotiating from 25 or 30%. So the investors will, the process is investors will prepare a term sheet in most cases, <coughs> present it to the company, the term sheet, we'll talk about the dollars, talk about the type of security being acquired, talk about liquidation preferences, talk about protections, and talk about stock option pools. So, that's where we end up. So, if the price per share is $6 a share, it means the founder's value is $600,000, paper value, so having 100% of the shares but no value to, gee, now we're worth you know, collectively $600,000. That's a good thing. Next round comes in, you raise $5 million. Again, the $5 million wants to buy half of the company. And you'll see that they want to maintain a 20% option pool. In order to do that, 111,000 options have to be added to the pool to bring it up to the 20%. And when you go through all the mechanisms, uh, there will be 880,000 shares outstanding total. The new investors are buying 444,000. The new investors are paying $11 a share. Founders value is now over a million dollars of paper value. You go through that a third time in terms of bringing in investors. In this case, the, the option pool only has to be 15% because you're now further along, you're a business, you don't need that large one. So you add an additional 2% of the pool. These investors are buying a third of the company. So this price per share that they're buying is $21 a share. Now the owners, 
The founder's value is over $2 million. The percent is declined from 100 to 30 to 11 and a quarter to 7 and a quarter, but the value of the position is 2 million shares, over $2 million. Then the company goes public. It sells 20% of its, uh, sells 20% of the company, increases the, the pool. Uh, for that, that means the investors are paying $108 a share, wouldn't even adjust the share numbers, but $108 a share. And it says that the founders own over $10 million. So going all the way back to the beginning, you will have some kind of mindset of where your company is going and what your aspirations are. Uh, this is sort of a textbook theory about how it would happen. It never does happen exactly like this, but it gives you a sense of the flow. And the question is, if we start this company and in five years we get $11 million, is that enough? And I can't make that judgment. Or you look at these numbers and try to, you know, uh, you know what are the critical numbers here? Which one should I tweak in order to try to get a more acceptable outcome? Or, gee, that's a pretty good outcome. Rules of thumb. When you are looking to add an individual, an individual, a lot of group of people, and you need to bring in a CEO who is a successful entrepreneur, who is able to go out and raise money for the company, has done it in the past, and that's the expectation. When you bring that person on board, they might be worth 8 to 12% of the company at that moment in time. In another scenario, the technical founder wants to remain CEO. So you need to bring in a business guy, a COO, a president, and that person is responsible for business operations. And so that person typically might get 4 to 8 percent. You're not going to give 12 percent to a CEO and 8 percent to a, a COO. It, it's an individual hire. Usually at the C level, the VPs or the chief investment officer, the chief revenue officer or whatever, Usually there are like two of those positions that are critical to the company. And those people will get between two and three and a half percent. And then the other C levels will get between one and a quarter per two and a half percent. And CFOs tend to be less than that unless finance is part of a critical strategic strength of the company where the financial uh, acumen Yes, Ray. So are, are these numbers, after the company's been up and operating for a while, maybe have some revenues, or on day zero, what it's worth for? These would be probably uh, Series A type numbers. <laughs> and, and that's, you know, is it before the Series A or after the Series A? That's always a challenge, too, because you, you could see if a investor's buying half of the company, and you're talking to somebody about 8% of the company, and they're saying, well, if the investors come in and buy half the company, does that mean I only have 4%? So you, those are discussions that come into play as well. But if you think of your company over time and the human capital that's going to be necessary for the company to ultimately succeed, you can do stock option planning to make sure you're getting to the right place. You don't need a VP of sales on, or you don't need, need a VP of marketing until the Series B round. Once you've gotten up and running, you're creating revenues, and now you've got to establish your brand, you've got to be a company. And you might bring that person on way down the line. Uh, so these are rules of thumb. Uh, 
directors of a company typically may be offered a half to 1%. Advisors might be a quarter to 50%. Directors are members of the board of directors, and as such, they have fiduciary responsibilities, legal responsibilities to all the shareholders. Uh, if something happens that's not particularly good for the company, uh, and they're held responsible, they can be liable, they will be indemnified to a certain extent, but you don't want to be there. If the company were to fold, if there were payroll obligations due, the directors might be personally responsible for providing the payroll. So they, they have skid in the game. Advisors range anywhere from window dressing, which you should, which all investors assume advisors are window dressing. You're going to get all these luminaries involved as advisors, and when you try to find out what did they actually help with, you're going to find out nothing, really. But if they really are providing support, they don't have any legal obligation. Depending upon how well you manage your advisors, they may or may not be providing value. Uh, some people look at an advisory board that will be a business advisory board or a technical advisory board. That that has some teeth to it and has some structure and these types of numbers are, are easily justified in those circumstances. Now, founder vesting. You know those 100,000 shares that I showed you on the uh, on the cap table over time, but you thought the owners, the founders owned those 100,000 shares. They started the company, they got 100,000 shares, so everything happened subsequent to that. Nope. Founder shares are subject to buyback along a schedule that's very similar to uh, the vesting, the stock option vesting. Now, I typically will invest, I will give the founders automatic uh, vesting in 25% of their shares. So they will own those outright. They are not subject to buyback. So in the case of 100,000 shares, that's 25,000 shares that are owned by the, by the founders with the 80. 75% being subject to buyback. And that expires 136 per month over a three year time period. And the logic behind that is if you don't, if one of the founders doesn't perform the role that they have been assigned adequately, you're going to have to find somebody to do it. So if you were to terminate that person, the remaining stock option would be the pot that would be initially considered for the replacement person. Or if a founder walks out the door, you want to be able to determine what they can own. Uh, and so if there is some kind of a break like that, you're going to want a pot of equity for replacing that person to do the job that does need to be done. And there's a lot of hemming and hawing about that. Because, hey, started the company, I own 100,000 shares, we own 100,000 shares. What do you mean I don't own my 100,000 shares? Yesterday I owned them. Well, the day after Friday, I said, you do, but you don't. Also, there is the issue of, of C-level uh, people, normally at least the CEO founder, maybe some of the C-level people, where if the company's acquired, they don't have a long-term role with the acquiring company. Entrepreneurs are acquiring plastic, they don't play well with others, they may not be all that constructive in the acquiring company or whatever. Uh, many of the functional areas may be redundant with those that are already provided by uh, 
by the acquiring company. So there are a variety of reasons why certain people may be carved out for different treatment. And uh, quite often, if that's the situation, there's uh, a method called the double trigger. And the, the premise is, gee, Mr. Ms. Investor, uh, my role was to provide you with liquidity. This acquisition accomplishes that. And therefore, I deserve acceleration of the vesting. And so at closing, half of the unvested shares vest. That's the first trigger. Then typically the same people responsible for assisting in the transition from independent company to being acquired. And so those remaining shares will vest over time according to the original schedule until such time that you are terminated without cause, generally meaning you know, you've done what you wanted to do, let's just part ways or if the person feels that they aren't being employed or engaged in a meaningful manner, they can leave the company with good reason, in which case the other 50% would, whatever's left of the vesting schedule would vest automatically at that time. So, you need to take a look at this whole topic over a period of time to make sure it makes sense. You know, to a certain degree, it's, it's like the, the, the salary cap at the NFL. You know, every year that, that cap changes and your ability to hire people is a function of what is available and what will be available. You need professional assistance. Uh, you need to develop mentors and advisors. And you need professional assistance. If you're dealing with, well, equity is a very complex issue. Anyhow, part of my job in this presentation was to scare you all to death. That this is complex. And I don't really get it. Some of it doesn't sound fair and all of that. So you really do need uh, professional assistance to make this happen. Particularly when you're talking about rounds of investment triggering this stuff. The investors do it as a day-to-day -day job. You're going to do it three or four times in your life, maybe. And the first time you do it, it is going to be terrifying. And so having this mentoring network and having good professionals who are uh, conversant in this area are very important. So uh, Allison will be sharing material. Uh, there are a lot of hidden slides that I didn't go through because I had to get done three minutes ago. Uh, so, uh, I'll, I'll stick around if people have questions and uh, that's the name of the game. Okay?